Next up is Olga Greenberg from Sutherland, Aspill, and Brennan in Atlanta. Olga defends corporations, investment advisors, broker dealers, and individuals in enforcement and litigation matters involving the SEC, DOJ, FINRA, state regulatory agencies, and numerous federal and state courts and arbitrations. Olga has extensive experience defending parallel investigations by multiple regulators from the early stages of inquiry to litigation and appeals. She also counsels on compliance, registration, reporting, and licensing issues, as well as on regulatory examinations and audits. Here to discuss the impact of admissions in regulatory settlements, please welcome Georgia's super lawyer, Olga Greenberg. Thank you, John. Good morning. Um, in recent months, I'm sure you have seen uh, a lot of press and you probably have heard a lot of discussions surrounding uh, the change to the SEC's traditional policy of uh, settling and resolving its administrative and civil cases on a neither admit nor deny basis. And the change uh, is to now require admissions in certain types of cases. Um, this change seems to come uh, in the wake of the congressional and judicial criticism that the SEC has not been aggressive enough with penalties and sanctions that it had sought in some of the biggest cases coming out of the financial crisis. Uh, most notably, and perhaps most colorfully, Judge Rakoff in the Southern District of New York had described those, what he viewed to be deficiencies on the SEC side, and refused to approve uh, settlements that did not contain admissions and were merely settled on a neither admit nor denied basis. He said that those types of cases warranted admissions, they were egregious in nature, and he would not approve the settlements. Uh, Rakoff was recently overruled uh, by the Second Circuit, but nonetheless, um, his rationale has certainly swayed the public opinion in this respect. And the issue did undoubtedly have an impact on how the SEC views its enforcement agenda and what it's going to do going forward. Last summer, uh, the SEC uh, chair, then newly appointed chair, um, Mary Jo White, announced that the SEC will require admissions going forward in certain types of cases. Of course, this was a fundamental change to the SEC's uh, settlement policy. Neither admit nor deny was always built into the SEC's template documents. It was always the norm uh, and never really a point of discussion, much less contention. So, the, the SEC's traditional policy of uh, including neither admit nor deny um, language really benefited both sides. The SEC could more efficiently obtain the results that it would likely receive a trial, or so that was the, the consensus in the opinion, and could more quickly return uh, money to harmed investors, which was consistent with its enforcement agenda and effectively could prevent the um, respondents or defendants from denying the allegations in a public setting with very, very limited exceptions. The respondents, of course, benefited as well. There was no omission of wrongdoing. Um, there was no uncertainty that's associated with litigating against the SEC. And the respondents, because there were no admissions, were somewhat successful in mitigating potential collateral consequences that can come as a result of the settlement. So once the settlement came out, I'm sorry, once the new policy came out, um, the pronouncement really created a flurry of discussions among uh, securities enforcement practitioners and a lot of apprehension in the industry. So the natural question was, or became, which cases fall within this new policy? And how do I know my case is not within it? Well, the SEC provided some very general guidelines, but really no constructive parameters. And frankly, what the SEC had said, or what, what, what Chair White said, um, doesn't really differ from SEC's enforcement agenda that we hear year to year, administration to administration. Not surprisingly, the SEC was interested in cases that it deemed egregious, that involved customer harm, cases that pose significant market risk, and um, or could be used to send a message to the industry for, its, for their deferent, deterrent effects, Cases um, especially that involve um, where the respondents had, um, were alleged to have obstructed the SEC's investigation in some way, meaning they didn't timely produce documents or the productions were inaccurate or incomplete and there was some um, intent uh, to mislead the SEC during its investigations. 
but again, there was no practical guidance and no outlined parameters um, to make an accurate determination or an accurate prediction as to whether a case would fall within this new agenda. So um, what is the, the practical implication of all of this? Well, it really serves as a, as a deterrent to resolving cases through settlement. And I think we'll see an increase in cases litigated against the SEC in the next several years. Some respondents or defendants um, in the civil cases simply cannot bear the risk of an admission because that admission would have devastating, uh, devastating consequences. But as a practical matter, the SEC does not have the resources to fight or to litigate every case that could potentially be within the purview of this new, of this new um, policy and that could potentially meet these general factors that were articulated to have triggered an admission and settlement. Um, since the policy was announced, the SEC has continued to resolve a vast majority of cases on a neither admit nor deny basis. Um, and has really struggled with the new policy because it really is at odds with its other priorities of enforcing cases and bringing um, cases on an expedited basis and returning uh, money to harmed investors quickly. So who will, you, who will litigate these cases? Well, there are really two categories of defendants or respondents that I think are, are potentially triggered. First, there are defendants or respondents that are also facing parallel investigations in other forms. So if um, the SEC is investigating a case, FINRA may have some interest, the state securities commissioners may have some interest, the state attorneys generals may be looking at um, the conduct that's at issue or the product that's at issue and, and have some interest. And the, the defendants or the respondents really cannot bear the risk of an admission with the SEC because they may have a collateral implication in those types of investigations. The other category of um, defendants or respondents that could be affected are those that face civil litigation or FINRA arbitrations that was initiated by investors. And in both situations, uh, we know that the other side will use those admissions and will use them um, in a very aggressive manner. Of course, the plaintiff's lawyers are loving this. They're 100% behind um, this new approach. They see it as a potential gold mine for both their current and their future cases. Um, they love settlement documents and they love to use them um, in litigation because they're quite detailed in nature. And if they have um, and if they have admissions in those settlement documents, it's just yet another weapon to um, for them to use. Once the, SEC, um, once the SEC action is concluded, of course, the plaintiff's lawyers attempt pretty aggressively to obtain a copy of the investigative file through FOIA requests. Uh, sometimes they're successful, sometimes they're not, but it really builds a roadmap for them in what issues they should focus on, how their cases will play out, what discovery they will seek from the other side, and really where the weak points are. My firm recently handled um, a matter that involved a number of parallel investigations uh, and also a number of civil litigations and hundreds of customer arbitrations that stemmed from the same allegations and from the same activity. Uh, this, the regulatory cases were settled first. Um, this was before the, this new change in the policy. Um, so there was an, they were settled um, on a neither admit nor deny basis. But it still didn't prevent um, the plaintiff's lawyers and the claimant's lawyers from using that settlement document and attempting to use it in their cases. Uh, and we fought very hard to keep, keep the regulatory issues out of the civil litigation and expended significant resources just given the prejudicial effect that they may have um, in that context. And one of our arguments was that you know, the regulatory action was settled, it's resolved, companies, respondents, and there were actually a number of individuals involved, they have their own rationale for uh, bringing cases to conclusion, it brings finality, and that particular um, settlement should not be used in a given customer arbitration or a given piece of litigation. Um, of course, the outcome um, of that depends on, you know, the judge that you have or the panel that hears your case, but at least um, the neither admit nor deny language gave us uh, room to make that argument. Um, 
how this is going to affect future litigation, um, this new change in policy where there's an admission, it remains to be seen, but it certainly um, has a significant prejudicial effect on collateral litigation. The other, um, the other aspect of this is given that the policy has, this new policy has received uh, some attention and people are paying attention to it, it's reported in the press and there's a lot of discussion with, uh, with respect to it, it will draw attention, it will continue to be reported and additional scrutiny by other regulators may uh, be a real consequence of this. So if you have an admission to liability in a SEC action, uh, the state securities uh, commissioners may pick up on this and open up an investigation. FINRA certainly would be interested in uh, looking into conducts of, of its registered persons and of member firms. Um, so that is, you know, given just the amount of press and just the amount of attention that this is getting is a real issue. Um, so where are we headed with all of this? Well, it's not entirely, not entirely clear. Um, so far, since the policy was announced, we've had about 10 cases. Um, none of them, frankly, have been terribly effective in accomplishing the goals that the SEC sought to accomplish. Perhaps uh, we haven't seen enough yet, and perhaps uh, we're too early in the process, and the cases that we truly worry about that have those prejudicial admissions are still in the pipeline. So I think the next six to 12 months are going to be very important, and we need to monitor this closely and really think about how this is going to affect things going forward. Um, but the, the 10 cases or so, fall within um, two categories. And again, don't show, they don't, they don't seem to be terribly effective in accomplishing the policy that the SEC, that the SEC sought to accomplish. The first category of cases involve what I call technical violations. Those are things like, for example, um, reporting um, issues or record keeping requirements, and they don't implicate some of these collateral implications that I just described, meaning there really couldn't be um, civil litigation or customer, um, admin, uh, customer arbitrations initiated based on that conduct. Um, so it appears that in those types of cases, the respondents and the defendants really could bear the risk um, of settlement under those terms. The second category of cases, the collateral consequences could potentially be a real issue because those cases implicate customer harm. But the settlement document, and if you, if you read it carefully, if you analyze it carefully, the settlement document was so um, well negotiated, and you can tell good defense lawyers were involved in crafting that document, that um, those collateral consequences really could be minim minimized. Um, those admissions in those cases primarily involve admissions of facts, not admissions of violations of wrongdoing. Um, and those are generally facts that at the end of the day are probably not disputed. They're probably supported by the documents that were gathered and the information that was gathered during the course of the investigations. And the admitted portions of the settlement document are clearly identified so as not to leave any ambiguity with respect to what is admitted and what is not admitted. And um, so clearly a lot of work and a lot of thought was put into it and people thought about the issues that I've just outlined before entering into these settlements. Certain settlements, I think there were two or three, involved, quote unquote, an acknowledgement of a violation. Not an admission, or not an explicit admission, but an acknowledgement of wrongdoing. And there are some citations to federal securities laws that are implicated, but again, those are not the traditional 10B5 types of cases that we're all worried about, the securities fraud cases. Those tend to involve provisions of securities laws that don't allow for a private right of action. So hopefully we will not see much litigation stemming from that. So um, the SEC appears, again, to have lost its steam. It appears that we're not in the track that we thought we would be a year ago. But again, it could be too early to tell because perhaps there are cases in the pipeline where um, the SEC will take this aggressive position. So if you are involved in an SEC investigation, you still have to be mindful, even though these implications don't look like they could become a real risk. Still, you have to be mindful because this new settlement policy is certainly a new weapon that the SEC can use. It has never used it previously, and the staff will use it as leverage. Um, because 
it will allow it to get higher sanctions, even though initially that was not the objective the SEC um, had articulated. Nonetheless, we will see that it will be brought up over time, and the right cases will get that type of attention. Now, what I, the other real implication of this um, is I think that the neither admit nor deny policy is going to continue to erode over time, and the cases that are not egregious today or are not egregious today, as more cases are resolved um, under these terms, will become egregious. We saw this in the context of fines that have been imposed pre-financial crisis and post-financial crisis. One of my colleagues jokes that you know, a seven-figure penalty 10, 15 years ago was a real number, but really now doesn't buy you much anymore. Um, because over time, the concept of egregious cases and the concept of significant um, fines has been eroded. You should also be mindful that um, a potential admission may implicate um, your company's or your client's DNO policy and really should examine that policy carefully to see if there's an exclusion that's triggered if, um, if you settle a case um, that contains an admission. Um, finally, you know, a lot of folks are in a very difficult situation when it comes to SEC regulatory actions. They're draining, they're long, they're expensive. Most people prefer the finality of settlement versus uh, litigating against the SEC given the resources that the SEC does have and the support um, that it does have. However, you know, if you're facing a case that, it, that may potentially implicate the new policy, may contain admission, the analysis that I've just described is very important and it becomes crucial because at the end of the day, it may significantly impact your business going forward and it's something that you really need to uh, pay attention to to determine whether you can bear that risk, whether it's through other parallel investigations or um, civil litigation or arbitrations. And that analysis needs to be done early on um, and um, hopefully all of the factors would be considered so that you may appropriately make um, the decision, do I litigate or do I not? Thank you very much. Thank you.